Hello everybody. Hi students. I hope wherever you're at and whenever you're watching this that you're having a great day and everything's going very well for you. Uh, this is the lecture for the Ancient Civilization class. This is the first lecture I would have normally given on April, the week of April 13th. So there'll be two lectures that week obviously and this is the first one. Uh, let's take a look at what we're talking about right now. And uh, I was discussing Charlemagne last time. Let's get him up here a little bit better so you can see him a little bit better. And oh, by the way, if you're wondering what this is, I, I did attend the Catholic University in Washington, D.C. They have a brilliant, excellent medieval school. That's why I went there. I got my second master's degree there. And uh, it was a very good experience because they had course offerings to get uh, almost nowhere else. <clears throat> Any event, our mascot was the Cardinals. Go Cardinals. Okay, we were talking about Charlemagne. Now, I wanted to show, hit, give you his importance as far as the development of civilization, also for the preservation of civilization. Remember, I said he didn't have a, a large bureaucracy to support him, and sometimes just having physical presence made a big deal of difference. And we do believe from examining his remains, he was probably about six foot four. Uh, <clears throat> that's tall for our, our generation, it's not terribly tall, however. Uh, nonetheless, if the average man was maybe five foot seven at this time frame, uh, you can see that being six foot four would be a very, very large man and very powerful man. So his presence did, really didn't make a difference. Well, he pushes back the Moors in the Mediterranean. Remember the Moors? These are Muslims that had invaded Spain starting in 711. And remember, they swept into France. And uh, Charlemagne actually goes on the offense against these people and starts pushing them back. When we were talking about the Moors conquering Spain, I told you that you could actually, uh, shall we say, oversimplify the entire history of medieval Spain by saying, by using one word, the Reconquista or the Reconquest. Charlemagne creates a, an enclave in Spain. Let's see if I can get medieval Spain up here again. To give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Medieval Spain, how about maps? Yeah, I I never seem to learn. I always get the wrong map when I pull this up. Let's try images. Now I mean a map there. The area that Charlemagne actually conquered. Now, as you know, the, the Pyrenees Mountains right here are very, very formidable. Uh, that could have been a boundary between the Moors in Spain and the Christians in France. Um, however, if you're going to start the reconquest, it'd be a very good idea to start on the other side of the Pyrenees. Uh, remember I said that this area was not thoroughly conquered by the Moors because it's wooded, it's hilly, and does not lend itself to cavalry tactics. And of course the Moors were very, very good on horseback. Um, the enclave in Spain, <clears throat> Charlemagne sent an expedition. If you're into literature, there's a medieval epic, the Song of Roland. And uh, it's essentially, obviously, it's a literary flowering. But it does talk about sending these men over to fight in Spain. This gives an enclave for the Spanish to start this very lengthy process of reconquering Spain from the Moors. Uh, say this helps stabilize Europe? Yes, it does. Let's get down here a little bit farther. Well, let's talk a little bit more about some of the other things he did. <clears throat> Charlemagne is ardently Christian. He believes that everybody should be Christian. Um, I believe there's a very good reason to support his, our opinion that he was an ardent believer. On the other hand, he also believed <clears throat> that there's a matter of practicality. 
he thought that he could get more cooperation. He thought he could get, shall we say, people to fight him less, work with him better, if they were, if they were Christians. Uh, at least they would have religion in common. Now, Christianity is being spread all over Europe. Remember I said that a fundamental aspect of this was the establishing of, <clears throat> can I have trouble again, establishing monasteries in various places of Europe. Very good for conversions. <clears throat> well, there's an area of northern Germany which we call Saxony. And I've been up there. All those people speak beautiful German. Oh my goodness, beautiful German. Any event, let's get the Saxon Wars. Um, Charlemagne's Empire, and this is actually a quite nice representation. So if I can get a little bit larger, that works a little bit well. For our purposes of understanding Saxony, yes. But for our purposes in showing you the extent of Charlemagne's influence, this would work very well as well. Let's go down and look at Saxony. Saxony is in this area of northern Germany. Well, <clears throat> over a period of years, uh, actually a few decades, the Charlemagne pushes in, into this area of northern Germany. These are Germanic tribes. They are not Christian in this time frame. And uh, he does, uh, Charlemagne does try to establish a few monasteries. He comes in with an army, and when the army is there, people tend, tend to back off. And when he leaves, then the Saxons rise up and uh, you do a little burning and pillaging and drive out the priests and drive out the monks. Uh, the major leader <clears throat> of the Saxons is a man by the name of Bidiquint. I do not have him on the study guide. But in any event, what happens is this. Finally, uh, Charlemagne's had enough. He's going, to, he's going to take these people down. And he calls this great meeting. Uh, let's negotiate this. And you people are not being good Christians, but let's sit, talk about it. So all the ma major leaders come together of the Saxons, and of course Charlemagne slaughters them. Um, this was a subterfuge, just really just an excuse to get these men together. And in slaughtering them, we can say that when you decapitate your enemy, in other words, if you have um, taken away the leadership, then most of the people would be, shall we say, more docile. The sources say the rivers ran with blood. Well, yeah, uh, obviously, that's an exaggeration, but it does mean that thousands, and sometimes he argues several thousand leaders were butchered at this time by Charlemagne. Uh, so the conversion now of Saxony is literally forced. Um, <clears throat> this is not necessarily showing how wonderful and kind you are. In reality, this is showing how forceful you are. I is it true to say that uh, if you can force people to conform outwardly to something that particularly over time and a number of generations would be quite appropriate. Uh, over time, you could actually end up <clears throat> uh, having people being controlled on the outside that can influence their mentality, shall we say, on the inside. And that probably works. It, it does take a while, but after a few generations of uh, supporting monasteries and supporting priests in Saxony, the Saxon does be, Saxony does become Christian. <clears throat> I'm going to call this an embarrassment to Christianity when you have forced conversions. Of course, Charlemagne is not a technically a church, has no church position, though he would call himself clearly Christian. Well, <clears throat> let's jump ahead about a thousand years, make it 1100 years. And we get into the time frame of the First World War, Second World War, and the Holocaust in Germany. <clears throat> There's some pretty bad things that happened there. And uh, if you want a further discussion of that, you might want to take History 151G, and we can discuss that a little bit. But I am very sure you are basically informed as to what went on. 
And we have to argue these things. Well, why did this happen? Why did the Germans are like this? And uh, I'm not sure we have a good answer. But a number of the <clears throat> a number of the theories include this: that Germany was never truly made Christian. Forced conversions doesn't make you truly Christian. So maybe the moral teachings of Christianity had not actually infused itself deeply enough into the German psyche to keep them from doing bad things. Um, I, I have a hard time believing that uh, a forced conversion well over a thousand years ago uh, would really have much of an impact on what has happened in, uh, in 20th century Germany. But I do want you to be aware of the theory, even though I really don't give it any credence. Well, let's talk about the Carolingian Renaissance. Uh, this is a rebirth of, of learning, <clears throat> an emphasis on learning from Charlemagne. Charlemagne's capital is really only there during the wintertime because on his numerous campaigns, uh, wintertime is not a good, good time to be fighting in Europe. You got trouble with weather, you got trouble with mud, you got trouble with snow. Uh, so he spends the winter times in his palace in, in Aachen. Let's see if I can find it here on the map. Uh, well, it's it's in Germany nowadays. It's very close to the border with France. So though I'm not seeing it on this map, it is about, huh? it is about right in here. Well, well, what does he do there? Well, let's recreate learning. Let's keep learning going. Uh, though this man is, shall we say, crude in his habits, he's quite a brutal man, uh, he does appreciate learning. What he does is he sends very nice invitations to the great intellectuals all over Europe. Come to Aachen, come to my palace, you know, come and and uh, spend some time working together. This is actually a very brilliant thing to do because now we have these men, most of them living in monasteries, spread around Europe that are called together at one place and one time. And the purpose for this is learning art and culture, which Charlemagne wants them to work together to produce. Uh, can we say the, the greatest intellectual among them is Alcuin of York? Alcuin was an Englishman. York is in northern England. And uh, he came down. He spent a number of years there. <clears throat> um, much is accomplished. But let's re remind ourselves of another thing. Um, when these men spend years together, but they don't spend their entire lives together, they come together, they get to know each other, they talk to each other, they get to appreciate each other, they work together. But when this is over, these men decide, well, I am a monk, I need to go back to my monastery. So they, they actually scatter back out to where they came from, you know, far away as, as back to England in Alcuin's uh, example, uh, down here, of course, in Italy as well, and in various places of France. But they do not lose contact with each other. Oh, we were friends. We, we did these things together. So we keep on writing back and forth to our old friends. In doing so, we're keeping up the traditions of learning. We're keeping up the discussions. Can we say that the tradition of learning survives hard times? Uh, hard times are right around the corner. It's going to get really, really bad really, really rapidly. But this is one of the mechanisms by which learning actually survives the vicious attacks from peoples on Europe. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. One thing that is created is a new writing form. If we look at most of the Roman writing, Latin writing, coming from the Romans, we tend to see letters that look like capitals. Um, the difficulty with capital letters, when you're writing manuscripts, you remember, they're writing on vellum and parchment, calfskin. And when you're writing these things, sometimes the capital letters get to be a little bit ungainly. Uh, so you use a minuscule. Uh, in other words, these are letters that tend to 
fit very nicely on the lines of, of a page and uh, they look somewhat square. Let's get some Carolingian Miniscule for you here. Okay. Looks a little bit round. These are upper and lower case. Um, uh, oh, that's Saxon. That's old, that's old English. I was expecting expecting to see something. Um, maybe this is a better example. This happens to be Latin. Notice that the, that these <coughs> letters are relatively square, and they fit relatively nicely within the lines. Now, usually, what you do when you're writing your formal manuscript, you would block it off. In other words, you would get your ruler and you'd make lines. The lines are quite hard to see, but as you're writing these things, the lines would be quite apparent to you. If you look at medieval manuscripts carefully, you can see that the lines are actually drawn. It works better with this, mi with this minuscule. <clears throat> In reality, we now end up with what we call lowercase letters. And keeping a lot of the Latin letters, the capital letters. As you can see, a good example here is you're starting a sentence or starting a paragraph. And the first letter you will put is, in fact, a capital letter. What this really means for modern Western writing is we actually end up with two alphabets. We don't usually say, oh, by the way, you know, we're, we function with two alphabets. No. We don't think that way because, quite frankly, we are taught <clears throat> that various letters, I want to show you B right here, um, that's B and that's B, so therefore we have one alphabet. Unfortunately, we do, do not <clears throat> because this B, this uppercase B, is really not that similar to the lowercase B. Um, as we look down here, there's some other dissimilarities. Uppercase D and lowercase D really are not. Uh, all that they're somewhat different, as you can see. <clears throat> the fun, the upshot of this is, <clears throat> I'm going to have a little trouble in my throat this morning, unfortunately. <clears throat> is that we have two alphabets. <clears throat> I could ask you a question: Has anybody ever seen Carolingian Minuscule? And some of you would say, "Well, yes, we have." Well, in reality, this is what you're looking at. Notice that this is modern type, as you well know. And notice the letters here. In fact, our lowercase letters, uh, look at the similarities here. Our lowercase letters are, in fact, come from Carolingian minuscule. And even though we have, once in a while, we'll have uh, a G that loops down beneath the line a little bit, our letters are, in fact, relatively square and they fit relatively well on a page. One of the reasons why when type was invented, we kept on using these things because they are so efficient to put within the space. So that's something that you and I even today get from the Carolingian Renaissance. Well, um, <clears throat> in assessing the importance of Chardemagne, we can say this. He does create a, well, he does create an empire. We call it the Carolingian Empire. And he does create, the, he brings in a lot of ideas. He pushes the, the excuse me, the Moors back. And uh, he even brings peace to a certain extent down in northern Italy. Because after all, being a good churchman, Charlemagne is a friend to the Pope. Uh, this empire actually doesn't last very long. <clears throat> it falls apart because of problems with who's going to rule after him. <clears throat> he has a lot of sons. And another issue is going to be external threats. But within a few decades of the death of Charlemagne, and he dies in 814 AD, his empire falls apart. But what did he accomplish? He bought us time. He bought us time. But and now civilization learning has a better chance of maintaining itself when actually it comes to external invasions. And 
at this time frame, we have some real problems. Shortly after, actually even during the last years of Charlemagne's reign, we have attacks, heavy attacks from various peoples. The Vikings, we'll talk more about them a little bit more, but let's look at the Magyars, if I can pull one of these up. See if I can get any Magyar invasion maps here. <clears throat> Where's a good Magyar invasion map here? Well, <clears throat> these are fairly complicated maps, uh, but actually this works fairly well in several aspects. The Magyars are attacking from this direction. The Magyars, as we can see in purple, uh, are very important in attacking Central Europe. Now, a lot of people like to come down to Italy. Whoa, they sure do. Why Italy? Well, Italy has good, good crops. Italy also has wealth because, largely because of the church. Um, this green lines right here are the Saracens. These are Muslim warriors coming off of what we would now call modern-day Tunisia. And they come into modern-day Tunisia and attack the southern coast of Europe, including Italy. I did mention that some of these men are so resourceful that, that we read about excursions actually go over the Alps and attack monasteries on this side. Uh, going back to the Magyars just for one minute, remember I said the Hungarians are not Huns. And, uh, but you see that the Magyars, who are now what we now call Hungarians, uh, were living in very close to the area of what you and I would call Hungary. So these are major threats and they're very, very challenging people. The one I would like to actually look at, we hear actually much more about, and that is the Vikings. And on this map, you can see some of the routes the Vikings took in their attacks on Europe. Let me see if I can get a Viking attacks and see if I can get a, how about a map? And see if I can give you give you a, like, an idea of where the Vikings are actually moving. Um, this simplifies this because they, you take off the Saracens and Magyars, and now we're left with what the Vikings were doing. Uh, this is helpful. We will come back to this. <clears throat> okay, let's take a look at the Vikings. Who are the Vikings and what are they all about? The Vikings, and I guess, I think the term Viking actually comes from expedition. Uh, sometimes these people are called the Norse, which is obviously very closely related to the North. And uh, uh, we hear a lot about them as being brilliant warriors. They are, they're very, very good at combat. And uh, they are sneaky because they come by sea and they can come up and get you. We, rem we uh, remember them largely as invaders and conquerors. We'll come back to that. We will also, uh, maybe I should have invaders, conquerors, and actually explorers. And we'll come back to that as well. So this is how we remember them. One thing I would like to clarify is this, that... And unfortunately, we're talking about uh, also a football team. And uh, I haven't watched any of these. I think the History Channel has a few things on them. But uh, let me clarify one thing. Vikings, helmet. There is a tradition, as you well know, this is the football team. And I pulled up the wrong thing. Um, we do have the idea of the Vikings had horns. Uh, I don't know where this came from, but the Vikings did not have horns. Many, many graves have been excavated. Uh, and we simply don't find Vikings wearing helmets with horns. Um, they had, I'd like to give you a, 
a better example of a, you know, th this is fallacious. Their helmets actually look much more like this. And, or like this. So, this kind of thing is actually a total fabrication. They really did not wear helmets that way. Okay, <clears throat> where do they come from? They're, they're Norse. They're, they come from the North countries. You and I would call this Scandinavia. So I go back to our map. Uh, can I get a bigger map here? Probably not. Anyway, you and I know Scandinavia as this area up here, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. These people have one thing in common. They speak a language that's closely related to each other. The modern day languages cannot understand each other. But during the, during the uh, Middle Ages, there's a pretty good chance that these people could communicate with each other fairly, fairly well. Well, why would they suddenly get on the move? That's never been quite explained. <clears throat> uh, one of the issues is that they might have been on the move because their population is growing. They don't have enough land to support themselves. Yeah, but the population may have been growing for centuries. Maybe it got, a crit got to a critical point. Uh, maybe they realized that their military prowess was better than other people's. And in, in response to that, they could go down and attack a lot more folks and uh, come back with a lot more booty and plunder. Yeah, that's possible as well. Um, another issue is that these people are not Christians. <clears throat> and Christians do not believe in more than one wife. You should have one wife. Now, this doesn't mean you don't have a mistress or two on the side, but this all but this means that formally you are married to one person. The Vikings don't believe this. And when they go on raids, and uh, we start raiding particularly, you can come down here and you can grab, go to England if you want to, you can go to northern Germany, areas that are relatively close by, and then you move back and you take your wives, you, you attack, you conquer, you go back. You bring your wives back here and you can end up with a number of wives, and you have more wives, you have more children. Therefore, there could be, a, once this gets going, there could be a, a population growth. Uh, that's entirely possible. We do believe that in origin, these people were almost all blonde, blue-eyed. As we go to modern Sweden, and I've never been there, of course, the number of blondes are pretty quite large. In fact, you probably find more blondes up in this area, men and women, of course, than any place else in the world. <clears throat> the The problem here is, however, that there's still an awful lot of people with dark hair. And uh, say, well, if they start out blonde and you have a lot of people here with dark hair, how do we explain that? Well, one of the reasons why we can explain that is simply this. When you're bringing back people who have dark hair, French women, for example, you bring them back here and they're going to change what the, shall we say, the biological matrix of your society. So this is some evidence that probably they are in fact bringing women back who are not all blondes. Well, the Viking Age. Let's look at the Viking Age. <clears throat> the Viking Age, the Vikings take the monastery at Lindisfarne. Can I show you on a better map? Lindisfarne is on the coast of hmm, um, on the coast of England. Let's pick on how about that one? Now, is this, let's see. Um, <clears throat> see, Lindisfarne, <clears throat> if you can follow my, this map, Lindisfarne is a monastery, it's right on the coast. Um, <clears throat> we talked about this earlier, why on earth would the monks <laughs> have a um, monastery right on the coast? Remember, they want to be a little bit uh, removed sometimes, and to them it's, a, it's actually, uh, to have a challenging place to live is showing greater devotion to the Lord because it caused 
you have to do more work to maintain yourself. In any event, this is easy pickings. You can see coming from Denmark, Norway, or Sweden, it'd be pretty easy to simply go down and attack this. That is not a big problem. Uh, we first read in the records about the, the Vikings attacking the monastery at Lindisfarne in 793 AD. Shortly thereafter, we read about the first attacks on the monasteries. Remember, this is where the gold is. This is where the wealth is. This is where the jewels are located. And uh, obviously, there's the food there as well because they have granaries. We first read about the attacks on Ireland in 795. The problem here is monks don't fight well. Quite frankly, monasteries are easy pickers. One of the reasons, another reason why the Vikings tend to attack them. The Viking Age, we usually say, leads, leads us until the Battle of Stamford Bridge in the year 1066. Stamford Bridge is up here in northern England. And in 1066, there was a major excursion from the Vikings in Denmark across over here. The English met them, and in a very costly battle to both, both the victors and to the vanquished. But in reality, there's such a very large loss of life that we do not read about major excursions after this time frame. This actually ends, or symbolically ends, the Viking Age. So we can say the Viking Age is, what, almost 300 years, largely from 793 to 1066 AD. There's serious consequence to this. I've already mentioned that they were attacking monasteries. That's where the learned people are. That's where the manuscripts are. So, serious consequences. If we're really trying to remember the importance of the Vikings, we can actually look at it from the loss of civilization, much destruction. The Vikings are not here to preserve what the monks have been creating. They're here to take what they want and to run. This is a serious threat to learning in the West. Well, how are they so successful? Go down here a little bit. They raid the coasts and follow the rivers into the interior. Let's go back to our map. It's got helmets now. Let's go back to our map and see if I can give you a good indication as to where they're going. Um, well, this doesn't work particularly well, but notice the extent of where they're going. You start out up in here, and getting down here to England or even over to Ireland is not terribly challenging, but they are very ambitious people. They sweep down the rivers in France. They go up the Loire. Let's get them. Let's get a better map. How about Vikings invasion France? And see if we can get 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 a better indication. Does that work? <laughs> okay. The major river systems: the Seine, the Loire. The Loire is a huge river. It comes way into Central France, like this. These are navigable rivers. You can. There's not a lot of rapids or waterfalls here. You can actually get on your boats to go easily into the interior. So raiding the coastlines are not terribly challenging. That is easily done. But uh, then you simply go into the interior as well. You follow the Seine. You follow the Loire. And if you're over in Germany, you follow the the, the Rhine River. Various river systems taking you to the interior of the continent. So, yes, they raid the coast, but they're also going deep inside. Even into the Mediterranean in Russia, let's go back here. Um, this is in the way. Let's go back here. You go into the interior. Let's take a look at this one. The Vikings come into the interior of Russia. In fact, they go deep into Russia, following the rivers into central Russia. Why are they coming in here? Well, one of the big places they would like to raid is Constantinople. 
this probably the most wealthy most has more gold and more things of value than any place else in Europe. <clears throat> so they want this. Every, I've already mentioned earlier, everybody wants to take it. We find Slavs trying to take it. We, we find uh, old, numerous times that the Muslims try to take it. Well, we even have the Vikings. And the Vikings follow the rivers. And you cannot, there is no complete waterway system that will take you across from one river to the next. So we have what we call portage areas. So the Vikings will take their vessels as far as they can into the interior. And then they'll portage their ships. In other words, they'll get logs <clears throat> and put them on the ground and roll them. And literally with manpower, you push them, sometimes many miles, over to another river system. And you get other river systems, including the Dniester. And even go as far as the Volga over here and come down this direction. Uh, and then now you're in the Black Sea. Well, that's a long trip. And you come down here and you attack Constantinople. They are not unable to take it, but you can see the, their ability to move long distances. As we talk about the medieval development of Russia, uh, these portage areas here, where you find men hauling their boats from one river system to another, uh, these can be places where you might have a, want, to have, want to have some business, want to have a have uh, some place where the guys can get, some, get drunk and drink some ale. And Moscow, the city of Moscow, which of course you know is the capital of modern Russia, was established at this time frame, probably to take to take advantage of the economic values of people going from one river system to another. The earliest known leader of Russia was a man by the name of Rurik. And Rurik was a Viking. So they, the, Rush, the Vikings are actually important in the development of Russia. <clears throat> okay, even the Mediterranean, go back to another map, which I probably took down. They have these men raiding on the coast of Spain, going into the Mediterranean. Later on, the Norse are go actually going to conquer Sicily. And uh, so they are extremely important for spreading their influence and usually their destruction in many areas. Well, um, <clears throat> how do you do this? Part of the issue is the medieval warm period, the mild weather. This has never been totally explained uh, by astronomers or geographers or historians, <clears throat> but for whatever reasons, there are a lengthy period of time, about 500 years, where we have very mild winters. Quite frankly, these are reading the sources. Uh, the weather is milder then than it is now. Well, at, during the medieval warm period, we actually hear about grapes. Remember, uh, in an earlier lecture, I told you that France <laughs> becomes a very important area, becomes wealthy for a number of reasons, one of which is they grow grapes and people during the Middle Ages drink wine. And they were actually growing grapes as far north as Norway. Now that's impossible now, it's just far too cold. Um, the ice flows, which we see in the modern world today in places like Greenland, uh, were not there during the Middle Ages. So you actually could move around in various places, the Vikings could move around in various places much more easily at this time frame because of warm, warmer weather. Uh, after it starts getting colder after 1300, then all of Europe faces a different kind of crisis. But during the medieval warm period, we find many advances. We find people that uh, uh, you grow more crops, you grow more grains. And quite frankly, um, until 1306, there probably hadn't been more than maybe one or two severe winters in 300 years in Europe. And of course, after 1300, Europe is plagued by a series of cold winters, which is devastating. Well, let's come back. One of the reasons why the Vikings are successful is they have a advanced ship design. And these ships are good for sea travel, and also shallow draft for rivers. Let's give you an example of Viking ships. Well, we have modern re recreations.
Uh, I've never been to Denmark, but I understand that the this very famous ship is in a museum in Denmark. Uh, before the, the Vikings became Christian, they would often bury a lot of artifacts with chieftains. And one of the reasons why we know a lot about uh, Viking art, Viking helmets, Viking weaponry, is they were buried with these important people. And the idea being that when that person lives again, is resurrected, that that person will now have this wealth and these weapons right next by, right nearby, so they can continue to use them. Well, one of the things they did, and on a number of occasions, is to bury ships with Viking leaders, put them in the ground. They have a tendency to preserve them a little bit better. Uh, get the idea of size here. You see people walking around. Uh, does it, can you see this is a shallow draft? By shallow draft, I mean it doesn't go deep into the water. I would like to show you a little bit better here. Can you see how the wood is laid out? We call this clinker construction. You can take, if you're building a boat, you can take and you can put the, your slats, your wood, essentially like this. Uh, of course, there's going to be an issue of leakage between the between the slats of wood, and you, of course you have caulking and uh, to shove rope in there and pitches and tars to keep it from leaking. But this clinker belt, can you see the slats of wood are on top of each other? So rather than being side by side, you have them here, and you go over and over and over. This is a very, very sturdy construction. You're going to have problem with leakage, but not nearly as much problem. Uh, these things are going to be rugged. If you run them aground, you run them into a rock someplace, there's a very good chance that you're not going to do as much damage. And with clinker built, because the surface is not entirely smooth, because they're actually on top of each other, you can see that as far as gliding through the water, this would be much more efficient in gliding in one direction. So this advanced ship design is very, very good. The ship design is so advanced, it's very good for sea travel, and it's also very good for shallow drafts in rivers. Rivers, of course, do not have an awful lot of depth. Sometimes they're very shallow indeed. But if you're using these ships to go up the rivers, quite frankly, Having shallow draft means you're going to run aground much less frequency, frequently. Obviously, this is a very, very important mechanism in their ability to move. Uh, modern reproduction, they were using square sails. If the wind is directly with you or even fairly close, you can move quite well. But... Uh, can we say one of the major ways you get around is rowing? <clears throat> That's awfully hard work. Uh, these men are buff anyway. These men are probably well built. They probably spend a lot of time practicing their weapons, uh, which keeps you in great shape. But <clears throat> you can imagine if you're spending days, weeks, or even months sometimes rowing these things, you know, you, you're, you're going to be a pretty considerable man. Of course, the people they're raiding against, the vast majority of them are farmers, and farmers are very buff as well. Uh, they're quite strong human beings. But uh, clearly, no doubt at all, the Vikings are pretty considerable men. We do read about them being somewhat taller than the other peoples in Europe, which also could have been an advantage. Well, let's talk a little bit about their exploration. Let's go back to how about North Atlantic and see where that gets us. Okay. Very interestingly, there is a tendency, depending on where the Vikings come from, where they go. The uh, Maybe I can grab another map for us here. Well, I'm getting way ahead of myself. Wow, way back here. There is a tendency for the Swedes, what you and I would call Sweden, to be the people that spend more time going over into Russia. The Norwegians, what you and I would call the Norwegians, 
do have a tendency. They, they, they raid. There's no doubt about that. They hit England. They hit Ireland. But they also spend time going across the Atlantic. It is quite frankly these people that go to Iceland and later to Greenland. Oh, getting back to my map, the Danes, people you and I would call Denmark, are more active in attacking southern England and they are going to lead out, shall we say, in these deep excursions into France and deeply into the Mediterranean. Take a look at North America. Um, <clears throat> the Vikings move from Norway primarily, other peoples as well, into Iceland. How do they know it's there? Well, they spent a lot of time in the North Atlantic. I don't know what they're doing out there, but when they ran across Iceland, they decided this is a pretty good place to, to settle. Well, it is good in some respects, but uh, you really can't go trees here. And one thing Vikings need very badly is, of course, the ability to have trees so they can build their ships. Um, but they establish the, the uh, Iceland here is established. And uh, uh, I've never been to Iceland flying, flying over the uh, Atlantic a couple, three, a number of times over the years to visit Europe. I looked out the window one time and I saw the coastline of, of Iceland. Um, I had a uh, an interesting experience with, on a plane once, a young man came and sat next to me. He was friendly, spoke really good English. We, we talked a little bit and he said he was in Iceland. And he was from Iceland. He was blonde. Well, uh, those of you who have been to Iceland, or any of you have, can either confirm this or deny this, but there's a tendency for these people to be very blonde even today. Um, probably meaning that not an awful lot of various peoples were brought here. The language they speak is actually, we call it Icelandic, of course, but it's actually Old Norse. When languages are in isolation, there is a strong tendency for their languages to change much more slowly. If, in fact, you were in places where cultural advances are more rapid, then the language tends to change more rapidly. Good example is Latin. People in, in uh, France speak a Latin language. Uh, people in Italy speak a Latin language. But since these are areas that are more culturally advanced, in other words, more changes going on, their language has changed more from the Latin than places like Romania and places like Spain, who are not so much in the mainstream, or at least so long, in the cultural mainstream. So the language doesn't change so rapidly. Iceland's been virtually isolated for hundreds of years. In fact, the modern Icelanders can read medieval manuscripts. This is something that you and I cannot do. Um, we speak English, try to look at, at Saxon or Old English, and you go, whoa. <laughs> we have no clue what's going on. Okay. Um, we know they push on. I'd like to get a better map for you here. We know they push on. In fact, around, in fact, we read in the sagas, these are stories that the Icelanders wrote about themselves, um, going from the Middle Ages, that in effect we have two major settlements on Greenland. Now, Greenland is not the Garden of Eden. I have a better, I've never been to Greenland, but in flying over a few times, I got a much better look at Greenland than I did at Iceland. And my goodness, it is it is bare. I mean, there's there's a few fishing vessels, I believe, out here, but it is rugged, it is mountainous, and only a couple places along the coastline could you possibly settle. In all likelihood, had there been as much ice flows in the Middle Ages as there were shall we say, as there is now, there probably would have been no Viking settlements on the coast of Greenland. Well, these people are in an area which simply does not have trees. There's still a problem in making sure you've got enough timber. Now, Canada, North America, is really not that far away. Did they, in effect, go far enough to explore North America? Um, that was argued for a while. There is a number, uh, there's one major saga which the Icelanders wrote. It's called the Vinland Sagas. 
Vinden being the Viking name for, or the Icelandic name, if you will, for this area. Well, uh, there's stories about they went down there and they met people called Skrælings, and uh, they didn't get along with the Skrælings very well, and there was some fighting going on. Skrælings, of course, you and I would know as Indians or native peoples of North America. Um, but is that really proof? <clears throat> we do find stories about people going up the Hudson River in New York, and there's big stones there. And, uh, there's one stone in uh, the Hudson River in New York, uh, up the stream a ways, where you find a stone that has, met, has holes drilled in three places. And well, the Vikings moor their ships that way. They'd go to a rock, they'd drill, drill in a hole. You'd stick in a pole and tie your ship up there. Yeah, they did that. Does that mean they were in fact there? According to the Venon sagas, they went to a place where they grew a berry. If it was grapes, how far down the coast would you have to go to find a place that's warm enough to grow grapes? Would you have to go as far south as Virginia? However, if this berry was not grapes, in fact, it was gooseberries. Gooseberries are a hardy little plant, and uh, they can be grown in areas of Canada. So how far did they go? It's, it is a subject of debate, but largely what we're dealing with is speculation. Hard evidence is hard to come by. However, the Vikings were in North America. There's no doubt about that. In a place called Lanzal Meadows in Newfoundland, this is Newfoundland, part of Canada, a Viking settlement has been found. I think, and my French is bad, but I think Lanz means, Lanz means something like Culver Bay. Um, about 1960-61, some archaeologists were wondering if they could find more information and uh, see if they could find any direct evidence that the Vikings were in North America. So they talked to local fishermen. He says, is there anything like uh, ruins of a village? They said, oh, yeah, sure. Down in Lansdowne Meadows. So they went down there. And right here they found, unquestionably, a Viking settlement. The huts were laid out as Viking settlements. They even found a uh, some iron implements that were probably made there. The Indians did not know iron technology. And these artifacts are clearly Viking. There is no doubt about that this is a Viking settlement. One of the things they found there was a blacksmith shop. Obviously, these people need to make iron for their weapons and nails, uh, various, various uh, materials. And you do get an idea as to how long these people might have been there. The way you can do this is the way that these people were using iron, and usually the iron they had was bog iron, but even if they had iron ore, there's uh, material in there that, which you don't want. And uh, the way you get rid of it, we call this slag, is you heat the metal to a certain, certain temperature. You put the metal on the anvil, and you take a very heavy hammer and go pound, and you pound out the slag, which leaves the iron, which is really what you want. Now, blacksmiths aren't, aren't really good in cleaning up their place. So we find the slag falls on the floor. If there was a lot of slag, it was quite deep on the floor, we'd have reason to believe that they were there for a lengthy period of time. However, in examining the slag on the floor, it's not that thick. Therefore, we have reason to believe they were not there very long at all, maybe one year. Um, recently, there's been other attempts to go inland into Newfoundland, see if you can find evidence of Viking villages that are not necessarily on the coast. In doing so, they found perhaps what, scraping around in the ground, what could have been a layout of a, of a uh, hut or something, which very much like the layout which we see in Iceland at about the same time. Is that proof? Probably not. But we do have reason to believe that it, there's probably more people here than just the people at Lansau Meadows. On the other hand, let's be completely clear about this. This is not a major migration. This is largely an exploration. When the Europeans really do get an understanding of North America, we're going to have to go to Columbus in 1492. But in discussing Vikings, it is very interesting to take a look and see how very, very good they were at exploration. 
Well, uh, let's go a little bit closer to home. Let's go now to England and call, look at the Dana Law. Remember, there's a very strong tendency for the people in Denmark to move over and attack England. The Dana Law, maybe this is a good map. <clears throat> Um, the English are pressed by these people. And remember, this goes on for hundreds of years. Yes, we do have initially raiders, you raid and you go back. But after a while, well, why raid and go back? Let's just establish villages and towns. Some of these actually end up being raiding centers. These are places where they, uh, you come and farm and those kind of things, but you build little fortresses and you wait until the weather gets better next year, and you can use these as places to continue to raid. The Vikings, the Danes in this case, do have a very strong tendency to control large sections of central and eastern England. Of course, there's going to be battles. Uh, we're going to fight down here. The Vikings are going to continue to fight. Um, we could actually say, depending on which time frame we want to discuss, that in reality, very large sections of England were controlled for a very lengthy period of time by the Danes. There was a Danish Viking captain by the name of Knut, about the year 1010, who actually claimed to rule most of England. Uh, so they're here, and they're here for a long time. Um, what is the importance of this? Well, there's actually an importance to this for the development of modern English. English is a very odd language for a number of reasons, one of which we do not have gender. Those of you who studied Spanish know there's a gender, there's masculine and feminine. Those who, you disc who have uh, studied French know there's gender, there's masculine and feminine. If you study German, masculine, feminine, and neuter. If you're talking about Czech or Polish, you have four genders, masculine animate, masculine inanimate, neuter, and feminine. My goodness. Uh, modern English doesn't have this at all. And many, and remember, modern English is related, we're cousin languages, to German. Now, we know that from historical sources. We also know that in similarity of words. But, uh, But how on earth do we explain why English is so screwy? Why it's so very different? Let's go down here and see if I can give you an example. Um, oh boy, I would like to give this a little bit larger. Uh, unfortunately, let's hope, hopefully you can see this. German, as I just mentioned, has three genders. Uh, we, when German and, and English were the same language in the early Middle Ages, you know, when, um, actually, when English are speaking Saxon, we do find there's very strong similarities. And let's take a, a common word. Uh, the term dog, we don't really know where it came from. Uh, but, of course, when you and I are referring to a small, furry animal with a big tail, we, are, we call them dogs. But can we say perhaps the original word was actually hound? And the modern German word for hound or dog is hund. So hound, hund, you can obviously see there was, there was some relationship between the two words. And uh, a, a dog happens to be masculine, der hund. In nominative, as you know, uh, you do have, you recall that the Der Hund. If you're accusative, like you're petting the dog, it would be Dein Hund. And dative is you're giving something to the dog, it'd be Dein Hund or Dein Hunde. If it's something that is owned by the dog, like the dog's collar, it would be Des Hundes. Okay. So this is something that survived very, very well into modern German, but not into English. How do we explain this? Medieval Danish and medieval English are fairly closely related. You don't quite understand each other, but 
you have a Danish village here, you have a Saxon or English village here, and uh, they're right next to each other for a very long period of time. You're trying to communicate. You want to talk back and forth. The, the word in Danish, the word in English are quite similar. However, the grammar is somewhat different. The inflections, the changing endings, or the article is different. What happens to English is they keep the words, but the inflections and the gender disappear. So no matter what you're saying in English, it is the. The endings, I run, we run, they run, always the same. It does not change. He runs, she runs. There is a small inflection that's left over, but that is quite rare in English. And I was talking to a German professor many years ago at Utah State, and I said, well, learning English must be very easy for you because you don't have to memorize all of the inflections, like if you're an English speaker learning German. He says, well, it's not as easy as you might think. I said, why is that? And he said that if you expect there to be a change, and coming from German, you do expect there to be a change, and there is no change, then that can be challenging. I hadn't really thought of it that way. Anyway, that's one of the ways we can explain modern English. Well, um, I wanted to tell you about some more of the rating centers. Go back to France. Um, I talked about the Danelop and the English were coming over here. Soon the Danes were coming over here and conquering England. And uh, this also happens in France. We find large numbers of Vikings who go up in places like the Loire River. They go up the Loire and uh, they establish raiding colonies. You're not going to go back home again in the wintertime. You, you sit around and you talk about your victories and plan your next excursions into central France. Um, there's very few places virtually in all of Europe where you're not subject to these attacks. So, oh, I want to mention one other thing. Uh, about the year 9-11, there's major excursions from Denmark into what you and I, I call Normandy right here. We call these people Normans. And uh, they keep the Viking heritage strongly enough to actually <clears throat> be remain to be very effective fighters. But you marry the local French girls, and pretty soon in the next generation, the kids are talking French. So these people are speaking French. In the year 1066, the Normans, we can call them Vikings if we still like want to, clearly strong influenced by Viking culture at least as far as combat is concerned. They raid across to England. In 1066, William the Conqueror conquers England. And in doing so, he brings the French language. And he creates a social matrix where the people speaking French, the Normans are on top, the people speaking English down here are still speaking Saxon. Another interesting aspect in the development of modern English. Uh, English has two words for almost everything. Uh, poultry comes from French. Chicken comes from Saxon. We have the higher class words tend to be French in origin. We have lower class words tend to be English in origin. Um, another aspect. Okay, any of it. Uh, how does Europe react to this? This is very important to remember. And that is you have to have the me mechanism of defense. There has been fortresses going back to Roman times, even as far as earlier than Roman times. The Celts, who were living in Europe largely before the Romans arrived, they're building fortresses. But the construction of castles really takes off at this time frame. Uh, you have castles. I mean, my goodness, you have castles all over the place. The uh, <clears throat> I, When I was in Stuttgart once in Germany, I found a book. I wish I had bought it, but I was cheap at the time. And it had lists of like 4,000 German castles. Whoa. Uh, however, we believe that during, during the uh, Middle Ages, there were, there were 10, 12,000 castles, a very, very large number. Modern Germany is about the size of Montana. Let's say you take several thousand castles. And don't, don't forget, Montana is a big place. 
But if you took several thousand castles and dropped them in various places in Montana, you would have a castle on virtually on every hill. You have a castle virtually on every bend of the river. You have castles almost everywhere. This 4,000 castles in this book was actually stating these are the ones where we still have ruins of them. So this is not a minor function. This is something that's very important in England and it's very important in France, Germany. Germany has it worse in some other areas because it divides up in the Middle Ages in small states and you have castles to fight against each other. On the other hand, the real booning construction came because the Vikings. The Vikings need a, uh, in defense, you have ma manners that have developed. You have the fortress. Let's go like this. Let's look at some medieval manners. Hmm. Let's see if we can get a map. This helps a little bit. That's an awfully nice, big, that is one big castle. But you have a castle. This is a place for defense. Um, in, if the Vikings or other people are raiding uh, and you're living down here in the village, you grab whatever you can, grain, a few chickens, and you run inside of this building and you are behind the walls and you have a means of defending yourself. So what develops is this. We have an upper class people, a warrior class, people that are here to defend. And then we have people down here that produce. In other words, they produce the food which actually supports these people and supports themselves. The reason why these farmers down here produce the food is they, they are desperate. They're literally desperate for defense. We do read about people that had been free in various areas, and France is a good example of this, that during these hard times, they actually come to landowners, wealthy people, and say, I, I'm willing to give up my freedom, but you've got to protect me. So manners develop. Feudalism. Feudalism actually means that as, as far as land tenure is concerned, the bigger noble uh, controls or at least influences the military on the local level. Feudalism actually implies, among other things, that the big noble, the man who controls large areas, he will say, you owe me military service. And, and sometimes these castles, like I say, this is a little bit misleading because that's a pretty nice castle. Uh, but sometimes you only have several warriors, maybe a dozen if you're lucky. And But for emergencies to defend the larger area, the noble can call on military service from these people. And sometimes it's for a certain length of time. Sometimes they can be called out for like 40 days a year. Well, um, the warrior class develops. Now, let's, let me comment one more thing about feudalism, and that's this. Uh, we look upon this as it develops over time, and it becomes very, very difficult to get rid of it when its function is no longer there. Um, French Revolution is a good idea, a good point of departure, because you're trying to get rid of it, at least to a certain extent, you try to get rid of the noble classes, um, to at least get rid of, rid of people that aren't supporting the lower classes. You see, it's hard to get rid of these people. And uh, before the French Revolution, you do have another problem, and that is, of course, these people are taxing you, but they're not really providing adequately for defense. There is a problem, and I agree with that, and it's, it's going to be hard to get rid of it. On the other hand, when it is actually created, it is a desperation measure, and it's a good thing. Well, warrior class. We call these the knights. Uh, these are people whose permanent job is actually to defend society. The knight is actually initially a warrior on horseback. Why does that make a big difference? I did talk earlier when we were talking about the development of the stirrup and later larger breeds of horses, where actually fighting from horseback becomes a possibility. In fact, it becomes the dominant form of combat because you can move rapidly and you can use the, the weapons on horseback in shock effect in attacking either people on the ground or other people on horseback.
But one of the reasons why you have this, you have to have the need for a quick response. Can we say initially, the warrior class is, is, is developed from somebody who happens to be rich enough to own a horse. If you own a horse, and horses are very expensive. You like having a young man, he's late teens or 20s, running around with a, you know, a, a fancy European sports car. They're very expensive. Of course, you throw in all the other military paraphernalia, weapons, armor. Uh, you have to be very wealthy. So the wealth does go over to a somebody owns a horse and the ability to move and later to fight from horseback. You need a quick response. Um, in some of our modern languages, the idea of rider and being a knight is still within their language. In, in English, knight does not necessarily denote rider. But look at German. The German word for a knight is ritter. That literally means rider. In French, it's <coughs> chevalier, uh, which means essentially horseman. In Italian, my Italian is horrible, cavaliera, in Spanish, caballero, rider. Now, the, the knights are successful early on, and they go on the offensive. Not only in places like France, they go on the offensive. But they push the Vikings back. And these raiding colonies, which I was mentioning, in places like the Loire River in France, the, Nikings, the, <laughs> the knights go on the offensive and are actually eventually able to rub them out, which obviously leads to a lot more peace and stability. But they remain as, why, uh, uh, as warriors, protectors, and as a means of repression, even after their function has been limited somewhat. Um, a lot of people are, are proud of their noble background. You know, knights end up being part of the nobility. Well, there's a lot to be proud of in that kind of thing. But we need to look at the totality of what these people are doing. Quite frankly, uh, later on, they become hired guns for the nobles. And uh, very often they are at least as likely to repress society as to defend it. And sometimes these people might defend you, they also might rob you. And as I talk later in this class about freeing of society, you're going to have to find a mechanism, a means by which to defend society without the use of men on horseback, a, a noble warrior class. Well, later on, I've already mentioned this, nobility, the manorial system, feudalism, becomes burdensome. Can we say even today, the vestiges are still with us? Largely symbolic rather than actual. Um, if you are a good soccer coach, for example, in, uh, in Britain, they make you a knight. You become sir, whatever. One of the more famous knights in England right now is in the Beatles, Paul McCartney. If you're referring to Paul McCartney, that's incorrect. He is Sir Paul McCartney. Well, uh, he was never in the military. He never led a man into battle. But this is a, a, an issue of very high prestige in many of these countries even today. So some of the vestiges are with us. We have the Queen of England, for example. She really rules nothing, but why is she the queen? Well, going back to a very lengthy heritage, going way back in the Middle Ages, uh, she had some ancestors who had some, some kind of titles. So the vestiges are still with us, though I would not argue that they are very impressive. Well, I would like to go on and talk about a few other things, but at this point, let's say it's been about an hour and 15 minutes. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I hope you're having a wonderful time. And we will come back later with the next lecture on the Middle Ages. In the meantime, enjoy.